we have a uh, client center from the Weizmann Institute of Science. The individual is going to talk today on the upper critical dimension of the third state loss model. Well, Hi, uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, this is based on upcoming work uh, with uh, Ning Su. I've been working on this project for seven years, and so there's been many other collaborators along the way. All right, so uh, why are we interested in planning the three state pop model? Uh, so first of all, it actually uh, describes uh, systems in nature. So, for instance, the critical three state pop model describes phase transition in uh, two dimensions. Um, for instance, uh, helium atoms on graphite at a third coverage, so a second order of phase transition with critical exponents that match those computed by theory. And this was shown many years ago in the 70s and 80s. Um, also, in three dimensions, uh, the Pop's lattice model describes cubic ferromagnets with three easy axes. Um, in this case, uh, this system shows a first order phase transition, uh, so it's uh, not critical. Um, so aside from the fact that the three state Pop's model actually uh, describes systems in nature, um, also just formally, it's the simplest quantum field theory after the IC model. Uh, simplest in the sense that it has uh, a few, just a few relevant operators and the global symmetry is just S3, which is you know, kind of the simplest after just C2. Um, the third reason why we're interested in this model is that the critical and tricritical Q state POTS models are believed to demonstrate the merger and annihilation scenario uh, for critical points as a function of either Q, the number of states, or D, the space time dimension, uh, when it's near Q equals three. So you don't consider tricritical easing as separate? No, I mean, tricritical easing is Q equals three. I mean, but it's sort of like the same. Sure. So. Yeah. yeah, I mean, well, well I just said that it's the next simplest, but usually I would say. Well, it's the next simplest depends on your definition of simple. Uh, but, <laughs> so, um, anyways, yes. Yeah, so, 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 so these are the various motivations for studying uh, the three state pop model. Um, so, the last motivation was the merger annihilation scenario. So, let me say a couple more words about that. <laughs> so, consider two families of unitary conformal field theories parameterized by some parameter S, which I'm letting be very general for the moment. It's just some real parameter. Um, and let's say these two CFTs have the same global symmetry and the same number of relevant operators, except one of the CFTs as an extra relevant singlet operator under the global center. So as we would change this general parameter S, uh, the CFT data of these two CFTs would get closer and closer until a certain S critical where the two CFTs become identical and then they go off into the complex plane, i.e. they become no longer unitary. Uh, and so this scenario was first described by these authors in 2009. And this is what's called the merger and annihilation scenario because the two theories merge and they in a sense annihilate because they stop being unitary. Uh, and so in particular, the extra relevant singlet operator becomes marginal when this S becomes S critical. I believe there are many papers before this. One. There were probably many before, but I think maybe the, the specific words merger and annihilation were perhaps coined by these authors. Uh, but yeah, the, the idea of, yeah, sprawling. <laughs> so the critical and tricritical Q state POTS model have the same S Q global symmetry, but the tricritical has an extra relevant singlet operator uh, when Q equals three. And so that's what makes them a good candidate for this merger and annihilation scenario. Uh, so in two dimensions, the critical and tricritical Q state POTS model, um, in order to discuss this merger and annihilation scenario, let the, let's make this generalized parameter S be Q. And so let's say for what value of Q do the critical and tricritical uh, Q state POTS models merge in 2D? And so for this, we actually know the answer. So as Q goes to Q equals four, uh, it was shown back in the 70s that the theories merge and then go off into the complex plane, uh, where the way they go off into the complex plane was described recently in a paper by Slava. Um, and so this is where we fix D equals two, and then the parameter we're varying is Q. Uh, and so in that context, the answer is known in this uh, beautiful story just discussed recently. So uh, before we talk about Q equals three, um, which is the main focus, let's talk about other values of Q and various values of Q. Uh, so when D is greater than or equal to four, then it was proven back in the 80s that Q critical is just two. Uh, and so in this case, the merger annihilation which occurs is in a sense trivial because the Q state possible in this case is just merging with the free theory. And so that's kind of the most trivial example of a merger annihilation. Um, when D equals three, lattice Monte Carlo studies suggest that the critical value of Q is around 2.45. So this was shown by Lee and Kosterlitz in 1991. Question, yeah. So Q, you let it be continuous in this yeah. scenario. So is it known what are uh, the CFP unitary for uh, um, non integer Q? Okay, so that, that's something I'll discuss in a couple slides. Uh, it's probably not. It's probably not. Yeah. 
Uh, but 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 it's a different it's a, it's a different breaking of unitarity than when theories collide. So there's, there's different ways the theory can be complex. Uh, question. Yeah. When the theories annihilate, they both disappear, right? But we still have three theories above four determinants. Uh, sure. Yeah. So okay. So I mean, I guess I guess in the trivial case where it annihilates the pre theory, I guess the pre theory doesn't disappear. So I guess it's just I guess it's just the non trivial one that goes away. I mean, so like, I mean, I, a, a trivial example of this is, uh, I mean, basically the icing model. Um, so like the fact that you don't have a non-trivial icing model in D equals four. That, that, I mean, that, that's what I'm describing. So then the mechanism is different. You can for the it's, it's different, but I would say it's related in that it still is the fact that you have two theories which are colliding. Uh, I guess maybe they're just not both going away. So, so yeah, so in, in that case, maybe you would say they, they pass through each other, except, except the, one of them goes away. So the theory that's not three goes away. There is a huge difference between this case and, and the generic case that you discussed with the beginning. But in this case, the pre theory has an extra symmetry with three. So, well, in the typical case, you said there are two theories which have exactly the same symmetry. Sure, but you're saying, yeah, that, because it's a pre theory, I guess it has enhanced. Uh, and then you have the solution of two theories which have different symmetries, but very different with each other. Yeah. You can pass through each other. Well, yeah, although I wouldn't necessarily say it passed through each other because in, it, it is true that the non-trivial guy does disappear when it hits the free theory. And so, so, so the reason for that, not that, not that it collides with the free theory. Uh, I mean, no, but I mean, it is disappearing because it collides. I mean, it, it's just colliding in a different it way. It collides, yeah. and then it may continue to exist on the other side, or it may disappear, you know, you don't know, you have to look into the details. It may exist as a non-unitary theory. Um, anyway. Um, uh, so for D between two and three, there are various estimates of the critical value of D and Q. Uh, and so let me briefly list these estimates. So Lattice Monte Carlo uh, generalization of the POPs model in fractional dimensions gave this estimate by Jan de Boer and Barkema in 1991 of 2.5, 2.68. Uh, there's various epsilon expansions which people attempted, although my understanding is that there's various issues with this epsilon expansion, so it's not under complete control. Um, <laughs> And then uh, there was another RG analysis uh, in the 80s, which gave this other estimate for D equals uh, 2.32 and Q equals 2.85. Is this like um, the interval or the interval? No, th th this is just D and Q. Uh, D and Q. D and Q, yeah. Um, so the problem with these various estimates is that, so the epsilon expansion one isn't really under control. Um, and the other ones are using some kind of fractional lattice. Um, and it's not really clear if that's the correct analytic continuation for miniature D. Um, so people just kind of propose these lattices, and they can only do them for like specific fractional values of D, but there's no reason why you should be confident that these are actually the correct analytic continuation of the known POPs model, which is defined in integer D by, on the lattice. Backwards, yeah, yeah. And so that's why they can only do it for specific values of D. Um, and so that's why, you know, it's not so clear if these estimates actually are correct. Um, and in fact, in some cases, they actually contradict each other. Why, would, why don't you say that the continuation to fractional D is not unique because one can do it in many ways. Um, why, why, is there, why would there be a... Well, it's possible there might be a way of continuing to real D, uh, which is better than these ways. In fact, that's what I'm suggesting in the next few slides. I'm saying, so like, I mean, th these were proposals that people made, uh, but they might not be the correct proposal uh, because there was no kind of compelling reason why this was a unique way of going to, to real D. Um, okay, so uh, let me describe what I'm going to say in this talk. Uh, so this talk, I'm going to use the bootstrap to find the upper critical dimension uh, from a natural analytic continuation in D. And I will attempt to convince you why this is the natural analytic continuation, unlike these fractional letters. Uh, so in particular, first I'm going to define the Q-state POTS model in any space-time D, um, as well as the critical and tri-critical fixed points. And then I'm going to review exact solutions in two dimensions uh, for various values of Q. Then in 2D, I'm going to use the conformal bootstrap to find kinks that correspond to the exact solution of the three state critical and tri critical POTS CFTs. And then I'm going to use the exact same bootstrap setup, increase D in a way which I will attempt to convince you is natural, and find that the critical and tri critical kinks merge and disappear at around D equals 2.5, which is hopefully a better estimate of the merger annihilation than these fractional lattices. Okay. So let's begin with a lattice definition of the POTS model for any D and Q. So consider a d-dimensional square lattice of random spins with the Hamiltonian of these spins, s goes from 1 to q, uh, and the following partition function and Hamiltonian. So this is just the usual nearest neighbor um, 
The subaltonian uh, obviously is an exact SQ global symmetry. Uh, when the inverse temperature is large, then you have an ordered phase with Q degenerate ground states with an SQ broken and one spin value preferred. When the inverse temperature is small, then you have a disordered phase with one ground state with SQ symmetry. So uh, you can then tune the inverse temperature to some critical value to get a phase transition, which is called the critical POTS model. Um, furthermore, you can consider a dilute lattice model where some lattice sites are vacant, and then you can tune both the inverse temperature as well as the chemical potential of these vacancies. You now have two parameters to get a tricritical POTS model, which is generically different from the critical POTS model. Um, so that defines the two theories we're talking about in this talk. Um, so first, let's talk about Q equals two, which is just the familiar icing box, either critical or tricritical. Yes. So hard to see this while you're standing right. Ah, should I go in here? Yeah. Great. Um, so let's start with Q equals two. It's the icing model. So in that case, you have the critical and tricritical icing models, and with this Z two global symmetry. So in D equals two, the Z two even subsector of the tricritical, in fact, has an enhanced superformal algebra. But this is not the case for D greater than two. And I should note the tricritical IC model D greater than two is actually unrelated to the N equals one super IC model. So they're, they're, they're different theories. Um, the critical icing model has two relevant operators, one which is Z2 odd and one which is Z2 even, whereas the tricritical has four relevant operators, two Z2 odd and two Z2 even. In two dimensions, the critical and tricritical are the lowest two unitary diagonal minimal models. And so particular means they're exactly solvable. So we know everything about them in two dimensions. In fact, um, these diagonal minimal models, uh, you could define them for general central charge C, uh, which is parameterized by this integer P. And in this case, they're described by a Lagrangian with the potential phi to the two P minus one. And so if you just take this Lagrangian, you can just check when this potential becomes marginal. And that allows you to read off the upper critical dimension, which is two P minus two over P minus two. Uh, so i.e., this is what's happening when the theory becomes free. And so this is what might, what you might call the case of, well, perhaps you wouldn't want to call it merger annihilation, but at least this is the case where the theory is merging with the free theory and then the theory is going away, but the free theory itself, I understand, is happy to continue living. Uh, so in particular, you can use this simple estimate uh, to show that for the icing case, decrypt equals four, because you just plug in uh, the appropriate value of p and you get four. Um, and that's indeed what we know to be the case, that the IC model is only critical below D equals four. Similarly, for the tricritical IC model, we know that it's only critical for D below three. And so this is kind of a trivial example of merger annihilation because just with the free theory. Um, so before we talk about Q equals three, let's talk about other values of Q. So for Q equals four um, in two dimensions, the tricritical and critical pots are actually the same unitary C of D which is the free scalar compactified on S1 mod Z2 with radius R equals one over root two, which has three marginal operators. This was shown by Dijkraaf and the Verlindas uh, back in the 80s. In particular, one of these marginal operators is expected from the merger annihilation scenario as discussed in Slava's recent paper. Um, other values of Q you can consider, you can consider the limit where Q goes to one. In this case, um, you consider a random cluster definition of the POTS model, uh, which allows you to discuss real values of Q, so not just integer. Um, in which case the C of T is now non-unitary, uh, but it's still useful to describe percolation. So this was recently studied by these authors. Lastly, you can even consider the limit where Q goes to zero, uh, which is even weirder than Q goes to one, and then it describes something called the spanning tree, which is not a CFT, but is still of interest to uh, statistical physicists, or so I'm told. Why is it not a CFT? When Q goes to zero? Yeah. Um, I'm assuming probably because it's no longer continuous. Uh, between 2D it's not, but between 2 and 6, it's pretty ah, So do, why, why is it not a CFT specifically in 2D? I guess it just doesn't have conformal symmetry. Well, the, let's see. I mean, there is this, I think this model has this OSP1 2 symmetry. Yeah, and then you can study the signal model and show that. It becomes gapped in the, so two is the lower critical dimension. Uh -huh. Thank you. But uh, <clears throat> yeah, I got the written paper. Uh, there was a question about the critical dimension for the, the standing force. Model. Yeah. And I think it's safe. Mm -hmm. Cool. Anyway, so, so this is just a brief review of other values of Q. Uh, now let's focus on Q equals three, which is our main interest. So we define the three-state POTS model, uh, CFTs, 
for general dimension D as conformal field theories with an S3 global symmetry and a certain number of relevant operators. So in particular, um, uh, S3 has three representations, uh, the singlet zero, the sign representation we call zero minus. So this is odd under the Z2 subgroup of S3, as well as the charge representation, which is charged under the G3 subgroup. So in 2D, uh, the critical POTS has two relevant charged operators, sigma and sigma prime, and one relevant singlet epsilon. Whereas the tricritical POTS has two relevant charged operators, sigma sigma prime, and now two relevant singlets, epsilon and epsilon prime. So the difference between critical and tricritical is that tricritical has an extra relevant singlet. So unlike the Q equals two POTS model, i.e. the IC model, for the Q equals three POTS, the critical and tricritical CFTs differ by just a single relevant operator, which is why they are a good candidate to merge and annihilate together. Yes. When you talk about the percolation theory. Yeah. I think it's I think it's the logarithmic computer. Uh -huh. yeah. So it's like on the Yeah. Uh, so so the fact that these guys, these two theories differ by just one relevant operator, this is why they're a good candidate for merger and annihilation. You know, unlike the icing case where because they differed by two relevant operators, thus it was like less likely that they would merge with each other. And indeed we know they don't merge. Because the number of charged iterators is not uh, controlled by by measure analysis. Enough. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, it's it's not it's not it's not a necessary statement. It's just less likely that if there are many operators that are different, that they would all happen to merge at the same point. So I mean, this isn't a proof. I mean, it, it's just an indication that it's more likely uh, that this theory um, could merge and annihilate. Yeah, indeed, it's possible they could still merge and annihilate even if one had ten more charged operators in the other. Okay. Um, so before we talk about general D, let's talk about exact solutions in two dimensions. So in 2D, the critical and tricritical pots are minimal models uh, with these values of C, um, except now they are non-diagonal minimal models. So that means they have a non-diagonal modular partition function. Um, this is unlike the icing guys, which was Q equals two, where they were minimal, uh, where they were diagonal minimal. <clears throat> um, so recall that if you were to consider the diagonal minimal models uh, with the same values of C, then they would have a Z2 symmetry, not an S3 symmetry. Um, and they would be described by this landau ginzburg lagrangian with the following potentials. So phi to the eight and phi to the 10. Um, and so these would just be multi-critical generalizations of the IC model. So in particular, the tetracritical icing model and the pentacritical icing. But those aren't the minimal models we're talking about because we're talking about the non-diagonal ones, which are the ones with S3 symmetry and which describe the POTS CFTs. So the critical POTS CFT, in fact, has its Vero Soro symmetry enhanced to a W3 symmetry in 2D. Uh, and it's actually the lowest central charge member of a family of unitary CFTs with W3 symmetry, as shown by these authors in the 80s. Um, the tricritical POTS also has its Vero Soro symmetry enhanced, this time to something called W25 symmetry. So this means that it has a generator of spin five and a generator of spin two, but not a generator of three and four, uh, because that's what you would call W5. Uh, what is, what is W? What, what is what, W? What is the symmetry? Uh, well, I mean, it's basically the symmetry which is generated by having um, a higher spin generator. So there are several algebras when you have a spin two generator. And if you have generators with higher spin, uh, then if you write down the algebra for them, it will generate a bigger infinite algebra, which is called W symmetry. Um, so it turns out that this W25 symmetry, which is generated by having a spin two and spin five generator, um, uh, you can only have such CFTs for specific values of C, because this is called an exceptional algebra as classified by Buchnecht in 88. So this is unlike W3, which is a bit more general in that you can define such CFTs, which are unitary, even for like all different kinds of... Um, and also the tricritical pots turns out to also be the lowest central charge member of a family of unitary CFTs with S3 symmetry, which are built from parafermians. So this was discussed by these authors in 1987. So... Both the critical pots and the tricritical pots are both kind of the simplest of some infinite family of CFTs in 2D. Although we're only really going to be caring about uh, these guys. We don't really care about the infinite family. Okay, so let's describe some details of these 2D minimal models because we can solve everything. We know everything about them. So for the critical pots, we have the following Vera Soro primaries uh, with an interest spin. Uh, these, these are basically given by a subset of all the Vera Soro primaries you could write down for the minimal model. Uh, and these are the ones that are given by the non-diagonal torus partition. So let's label these operators by their scaling dimension delta. So remember that in 2D, the scaling dimension is the sum of the left and right weights. Uh, the spin, which would be the difference between the left and right, white, the left and right weights, as well as the representation under the S3 symmetry. 
So here we have sigma and sigma prime, which are the two charged operators, both relevant. We have epsilon, which is the singlet operator, which is relevant. Then we have epsilon prime and epsilon double prime, which are both irrelevant. Um, and then we have these other operators that are charged under the sign representation. And notice that we have this operator W, which is a spin three conserved current. And so this is why you have this W3 symmetry, because as you know, did mentioned before, you have not only you know, the stress tensor, but also this, this W. Uh, so these are the various solar primaries. Uh, you can also discuss quasi-primaries, uh, i.e. primaries under just the global conformal group, in which case you would also have the stress tensor, and then you would have an infinite class of operators given by acting on uh, these various solar primaries. Isn't this a bit weird that W is not a singlet? Why should it be a singlet? I mean, like mo most generators are in the sign representation. Uh, it's the sign representation of S3. I, 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 think it's in, I think it's in the sign representation. I mean, maybe the typo, but I, I think it's in the sign representation because it has odd, it has odd spin. So I think it can't be in the single representation because then it would have even. Oh, okay. yeah. So I think that's, that's why it's expected. Explain it, you pick up the minus sign when you make an odd. Yeah, yeah, under C2. Okay. Uh, so. There is a way to understand W. A physical way to understand it. So the CP data on the You're saying like why does the critical pots model have, have this W? Uh well it depends what you mean by physical explanation. Yeah. <laughs> does anyone in the audience have a have a more physical explanation? Is it obvious from the physics or it's a surprise from the solution? There is a down peaceful with a phi cube plus uh phi lack of cube, which is yeah, yeah. complex. complex. Yeah. But uh well, I don't know. I mean it's not very very <laughs> Yeah, I don't know about it. With a, no, that about the yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think the Lando Gisbert description is not so good for the POTS model. And also, I don't know if I'd call it a physical description. I think the uh, thing is that this is critical in six dimensions, right? Yeah, no, but, yeah but, but we're only talking about 2D here. So, so I think this isn't so, so relevant to the question. So like the question is why in 2D, is, it, is there a physical explanation of why you have this W3 symmetry? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it, it's a coincidence in 2D. I mean, you don't have this the moment you go above 2D. So like that. Uh, I think it's just, you know, all kinds of funny things happen in 2D. Yeah. Okay, so for the uh, 2D tricritical pot CFD, so now we have the following set of uh, Vero Soro primaries. So again, we have sigma sigma prime, both relevant. We, there's also a sigma double prime, which is irrelevant. We have epsilon and epsilon prime, both are relevant now, because remember you have two relevant singlets, as well as epsilon double prime, which is irrelevant. Uh, you have even more epsilons, epsilon triple prime, epsilon quadruple prime. And then you have various operators in the sign representation, including the notorious W, uh, which is spin five in this case. And so this is why as advertised, it has this enhanced symmetry W25, given by both the stress tensor as well as this W. And so this is just another kind of curiosity in 2D. This is something which you would not generically have above 2D. And so indeed, I don't have a good physical explanation of why that's the case. It's just something you observe from the non-diagonal minimal model. Um, okay. So uh, because these are minimal models, you can compute everything. So you know all the scaling dimensions as discussed in the previous slide. And in fact, you also know all the OP coefficients. Um, so this was, it was shown in the 80s how you could actually compute OP coefficients for non-diagonal minimal models. So this algorithm was carried out in the case of the critical pots theory uh, to compute all the OP coefficients. Here, I'm just showing you what one of them looks like. So it's some ratio of gammas with weird fractions. Um, uh, for the tricritical case, I don't think anyone actually uh, did this algorithm, although a few of the OP coefficients are computed in this paper by Zamologikov and Pate. Um, so one kind of curious fact about 2D is that for both the critical and tricritical pots, many OP coefficients that would be allowed by S3 symmetry in general D are actually zero in 2D, uh, which can be explained by the fact that you have this enhanced Virasor or even W algebra constraints. Uh, so, so for instance, the OP coefficient of three singlet epsilons is zero, uh, which is something you observed uh, also in the IC model um, in 2D. But this is something which isn't generically true once you go above 2D. And so, so you can't use the special information you know, to somehow fix the CFT for general. Um, okay, so let me just give one more comment. Before I mentioned that the critical pot CFT in two dimensions is the lowest member of a family of W3 minimal models uh, given by these integers P starting with four. So P equals four is uh, the critical pots in this case. And the central charge C is a function of P as shown. Um, and so these are also theories that you can solve exactly because they're minimal models. Um, and you can compute their scaling dimension. They're given by this uh, compact formula. Um, and so I should note that the number of relevant operators goes with P. But the fusion rules show that if you look specifically at the OPE between sigma and sigma, then only two uh, Virasoro primaries appear. 
which is sigma and sigma prime. And this is the case uh, for all p equals one or two mod three. Um, so the reason why I'm discussing this more general class of S3 symmetric theories is because specifically in 2D, these will actually appear in the bootstrap plots, as I'm about to show you. Um, okay, so now let's discuss the general strategy of how we're going to bootstrap these pots of CFTs. And we want a strategy which will work in general D, because that's our whole you know, point. Um, so for all D greater than equals to 2, we're going to consider the global conformal group, SOD plus 1, comma 1. Uh, so in particular, in 2D, we're going to consider quasi primaries. So we're never going to use the Verisero group or the W group or whatever. So as usual, we consider correlators of relevant scalar operators. So that means for the critical theory, we're going to have sigma, sigma prime and epsilon. And for the tri-critical, we're also going to have epsilon. Prime. And so let's start by considering the correlator of just one operator. So the simplest guy, just sigma. Uh, so here's a four-point function of four sigmas, the different space-time points. So more abstractly, we consider the correlator of a scalar in the charge representation uh, and the lowest dimension one. And so, so we don't have to think of it like specifically as sigma. We can just look at it from an abstract perspective. Uh, and in a few slides, I'll talk about mixed correlators. For now, I'm just talking about results. I'm just looking at a single correlator. And so let me briefly review how the bootstrap works, although hopefully some people in the audience are familiar. There will also be many other talks in the bootstrap in this uh, lecture series. Um, so we expand this correlator of four sigmas in conformal blocks for each representation under S3 that appears in this tensor product. So we have the singlet, the sign, as well as the charge. So here we expand in blocks, G, which are labeled by the conformal dimension and the spin of the various operators that appear in the OPE. Um, and we factor out this position dependence. Um, and note that you only have even spins for the singlet and charge representation, whereas you only have odd spins for the sign representation. So the way the bootstrap works is that because we're considering a Euclidean CFT, on the left-hand side, we can permute these four operators however we want, and it should give the same answer. So in particular, if we permute the first and the third operator, uh, that would change the right-hand side, but it has to be the same. And so equating these two ways of writing the four-point function gives an infinite set of crossing equations. In particular, these are the same crossing equations as you would get for the O2 fundamental bootstrap. Uh, but, but this is just a mathematical coincidence. You know, there's no, no, there's no physical meaning to that. Um, I should note that if you were to consider general Q, not Q equals three, uh, then as long as Q does not equal two or three, you would generically have four crossing equations for correlators of fundamentals under SQ as showed by wrong and two. Uh, and so there's something kind of special to Q equals three when looking at this specific uh, four part. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, basically without making assumptions about the spectrum of operators, you can't distinguish between them. We don't really have to worry about that in, in 2D at least, you know, because there's no O2 theory in, in, in 2D. Uh, the fact that they're the same, it, it basically just comes down to the fact that four point functions of charged operators, you know, I guess look similar no matter what you're charging them under. Um, so, but, uh, but I would just consider it as a coincidence. I don't think there's anything particularly deep. Uh, uh, okay, so let's look at the bounds you get. Um, from looking at just this four-point function of sigma, specifically in 2D. Um, for the bootstrap experts, this was computed with nmax equals 14, which is basically just an estimate of how precise you're, you're setting your bootstrap. So these bounds will monotonically get better as you increase nmax. And so the blue region is the region allowed by the bootstrap. Everything else is disallowed. Um, and so there's various features we can observe. So first of all, this red dotted line is just a guide beyond. So, so that's just showing that it's basically a straight line, and then it stops being a straight line at some point. Uh, the purple points are this family of S3 um, CFTs, of which the critical theory is the minimal one. So this is the one which I was describing a few slides ago. I was saying there's this infinite family, and the minimal one is the critical pots. And so, they, and that was, and this is labeled by P, so you have P equals four, five, six, et cetera. And so these are all along the line. And notice that the line is very, very close to the upper bound. And so it seems reasonable that, like in the limit of infinite bootstrap precision, these minimal models would actually be right on the upper bound. And this is kind of cool. This is something analogous to what people observe when bootstrapping Z2 CFTs, in which case they noticed that the infinite family of Z2 minimal models was also right along the upper boundary. Um, another feature of this plot is that in addition to there being this kink where the critical theory is, there's another kink very close to where the tricritical theory is. So that's labeled by the blue dot, because of course we know exactly where it is, it's in 2D, and it's very close to a kink in this bound. Um, although it's not exactly close. So one might hope that perhaps with more precision, it would be exactly there. Um, but also, this is just the result from a single correlator. So you know, also with mixed correlators, we'll see better results. Um, so any questions about this plot before we move on? Yeah, so what I assume here about 
Um, so we're not making any assumptions about epsilon epsilon prime, but we are assuming that sigma and sigma prime are the only two relevant upper. But epsilon epsilon prime is totally general. So the only two relevant charged upper. Yeah. Yeah. So so this plot is not really using the full information about the Pops theorems, you know, because we're not imposing the number of, of singlets. Um, and so that's why it's you know perhaps not surprising that this plot. You know, while while roughly showing some kinks near critical and tricritical, certainly has a lot of room for approval. Are you about uh, zero minus operators that are irrelevant? Um, in this plot, I didn't make any assumptions about that. Although in subsequent plots, I will, because also in this plot, you only have the sign representations for odd spin, anyways, um, and so that's why the, there wouldn't really be any natural assumptions. So, any further questions about this plot? Uh, great. Okay, so now let's do something more powerful. Let's consider mixed correlators. So not just the correlator of sigma. So now we consider all correlators of sigma, sigma prime, and epsilon. So this gives 39 frosting equations, uh, which for those who follow these things is a lot of frosting equations. Uh, so this includes correlators like sigma, 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 epsilon that would be not, that would be zero if we were doing a Z2 bootstrap, but are non-zero because we're doing an S3, which is kind of one of the novelties of S3. And so the assumptions we put is that the only relevant operators that are scalars um, in the singlet or charge representations are sigma, sigma prime, and epsilon. This is for the critical theory. Um, and in the sign representation, we assume there are no relevant scalars. And so this is motivated by what we saw in Um We also impose that these operators are unique. So i.e. there's no degenerate operators of the same dimension. And the way we do this is by scanning over ratios OP coefficients, which was um, demonstrated to this efficiently uh, in this recent paper. Um, and so you might say like, okay, wouldn't it be crazy if there'd be degenerate operators that, which, which both had the exact same random dimension? So indeed that would be crazy. But the thing is that the bootstrap doesn't know that. And so that's why by imposing this, it actually really does improve the balance, uh, which perhaps is a bit surprising. Um, so this is a very large search space because it turns out there's 10 parameters we need to scan over. So we have three scaling dimensions, sigma, sigma prime and epsilon, and also seven ratios of OB coefficient. And so it's very computationally expensive to scan over such a huge space, especially also with 39 crossing equations. And so this is a plot we're still working on because this is unfinished. Um, but in two dimensions, we're basically making a plot in the space of these three scaling dimensions. And you can see kind of vaguely uh, from this unfinished plot that you get some kind of dagger shaped region whose point is right where the critical POTS model is expected to be, which is given by this purple dot. And so th this is uh, some, some uh, an unfinished plot so far. And, but this plot you know, is very tedious to make because we're scanning over 10 parameters uh, with tons of cross -reactors. And this plot, what we did the red dots are excluded and you have some allowed points? Yeah, so the red dots are excluded, the black dots are allowed. Uh, we're, still, we're still running additional points. Um, and like, uh, it's not expected to be an island. I mean, it's, we just haven't looked at enough points on, on that side. Uh, the main point of this plot is just to emphasize that there is like a kink basically in this three-dimensional space right near where the critical pops theory is. So that, that, that's the, the main lesson of this unfinished plot. Um, but we'd like to do... Where are the plots? Sorry? Uh, where are the plots? Where, where, where is oh, the yeah. critical pots is the purple dot. Yeah, and what about the plots? Uh, well, the tricritical pots we're not looking at because we're, we're just looking... I mean, our assumptions exclude the tricritical pots. Okay. Tricritical yeah. Pots. yeah, we're just looking at critical pots. Our assumptions exclude the tricritical pots because we're assuming there's only three relevant operators, um, which kill the tricritical. Um, okay, so is there a better way to find where this kink is in that plot? So without having to like do a full scan over like, you know, 10 dimensional space, could you just directly find the point of the dagger? The answer is yes. And you can do that using something called the navigator method, which was developed uh, just in the last year by uh, various authors in the audience. Uh, so basically you define a certain function called the navigator. It's a function of the 10 parameters we're scanning over. And the point of this navigator function is that the gradient tells you the direction that you want to go towards the boundary of the allowed region. And so instead of having kind of like, instead of just doing some stupid grid in, in three or 10 dimensional space, which would take forever, instead you can define this function, which tells you how to get to the boundary of your allowed region. And then in particular, because we know the point of this dagger is in the direction of minimizing delta sigma, thus we just minimize the navigator in terms of delta sigma to get to the tip of the dagger, which is defined by a gradient normal to the boundary. And so if we run if we run this navigator bootstrap for n max equals six in two dimensions, then we get the following answer, uh, which you should compare to the exact answer known to the minimal model. And you see that it's actually pretty good. So it matches to three digits, you know, for all three of the critical exponents. And note that 
This answer was gotten just with n max equals six, which is like fairly low bootstrap precision. The reason why we only do n max equals six is because this is an incredibly complicated bootstrap problem. And so this is kind of like really reaching the limit of current technical capabilities. Nonetheless, the answer is pretty good in that, in that it matches to, to, to three digits. So now let's do mixed correlators for the tricritical positive. So in this case, we impose that the only relevant operators are now sigma, sigma prime, epsilon, and epsilon prime. So we're allowing an extra relevant operator relative to the critical paths set. Um, the search space would be incredibly huge now because we have this extra operator. And so uh, in order to make this technically feasible, we only consider mixing of sigma and sigma prime. So we have 21 crossing equations uh, for this setup. Um, we, we want to, again, scan over ratio of zope coefficients because that you know, improves our results. So uh, because we have four relevant operators, we now have 13 parameters, which is the four scaling dimensions of each relevant operator, as well as nine ratios of OPE coefficients. So this is a huge parameter space. I believe 13 parameters is the most parameters that anyone has applied the navigator to two yet, although hopefully we'll be able to do more in the future. Um, so, this, so, so just to uh, emphasize, this is like the very limit of the capability of current navigator technology. So each run, which was performed with, um, good. Um, so each run, which was performed with n max equal six, would take three weeks using 54 cores. So, so it was a very intense calculation, uh, which is why this study took so long. It's also why we can only do this study now and not seven years ago when we first thought about this project. Um, anyways, so just as we did in the case of the critical model, um, uh, I think you need to click the screen again, excuse me. You need to click the screen again because my, my, my thing is working. Well, to, to, get, to get the navigator to minimize and to get the point of this dagger. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, each iteration of the navigator, you know, doesn't take three weeks. I mean, it takes like well, maybe a few hours or something, but like, but you have to do like 200 iterations. Yeah. Uh, we're minimizing delta sigma, the scaling dimension of sigma. And our motivation is because when we looked at the three dimensional plot, we saw that the point of the dagger could be found by minimizing delta sigma. And so now for the case of the tricritical theory, we find that the navigator gives this result, which again is very close to the exactly known result. Um, it's not as precise. Uh, it's kind of unfortunate. Is there a way to remove that law parole thing? Uh, <laughs> kind of blocking some crucial information. Um, I don't even know what law parole means. Um, so, uh, not the voice. Um, so, uh, so as you now see that the, now the box has been removed, uh, the estimate for epsilon prime is actually pretty good. And that's the guy we care about the most. Uh, and the estimate, estimates for the other ones are also pretty good. I mean, that's not as accurate as critical. This is to be expected because after all, we're looking at a smaller subset of frosty equations, which we were forced to do just by technical limitations. But I would say it, it, it's still pretty good, you know, enough that we're convinced that we're really finding the tricritical theory. Hopefully you guys are convinced as well. So I'm a little bit confused. So now you're getting smaller results because you're not imposing the epsilon well, because you know it's a less strict assumptions. We're allowing for an extra relevant operator. You're allowing just one. Yeah. yeah. We're so we're allowing, we're allowing two relevant singlets, epsilon epsilon prime, whereas in the critical setup we were only allowing for one. So that's why it's reasonable that we would get you know uh, the, 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 these different results. Just minimizing your sigma and or is this one? It's just just minimizing delta. Based on n Sorry. Uh, n I, I I couldn't catch it. M p Empirical, yeah, 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 yeah. So this is an empirical observation, uh, which is that, I mean, it's motivated by the fact that in the critical case, we noticed there was a dagger plot. In principle, it would be nice to make a similar plot in the tricritical case, but that'd be very hard, because there'd be some four dimensional space. But like empirically, I guess our assumption is that there will be some similar kind of kink in the four dimensional space by which finding the point of that kink would give you the tricritical theory. And uh, evidence for this conjecture is the fact that when minimizing delta sigma, we get this answer, which matches very accurately the minimal model in 2D. So the value you get is actually less than the exact value, which is 0 0.0944. Yeah, although, I mean, like, as we would increase n max, there's no way to know how these values would change. I mean, like, this is not a rigorous assessment. Right. So it's yeah. not like. Uh... Yeah, because basically what we're doing is we're finding like the point of a king. Uh, and so that king could move, you know, I guess in many. Uh, in fact, probably would actually move inward because I would imagine like the allowed reason gets smaller as you increase n max. So that's why it makes sense that right now the navigator is smaller and then it would get you know more inward. Uh, so, so I think that's actually to be expected. So have we estimated the entire bar of all the operators? For example, you can just express the operation state management and then estimate and calculate the most of the knowledge of the first, the last part. 
We should get a final win on that range. Right? Yeah, yeah. So we, we, we have an estimated the error bars. I mean, also, it would be nice to see how this changes the Venmax, but we haven't done that it's simply just because these drones are so expensive. So, so yeah, very expensive. Then, if we uh, minimize one of yeah. all the third evidence of other options, it could be just a brand may not be related to it. Sorry, no, but we're matching all, all, all four. Yeah, for example, you can, the, the allow reader for other operators can be very large. You don't have that. You don't have well, no, no, no. But the point is, is that, like, like this is the this is like a it's like a point of a dagger shaped region. Yeah. And so at this point, they're all constrained. You know, it's basically a unique point. So like, you know, like there there is no error bar. So I would say the error bar is zero. You know, in this case, because like it really is the point. So it's like well, I I mean, as mentioned, when we minimize the navigator, the navigator function terminates. When you get the gradient normal to the boundary. Yeah, for, for the yeah, 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 yeah. So, so I, I don't have an analogous plot of the tricritical, but you can just see from the results of the navigator function that you will find that the gradient is normal to the boundary. And so, like, you can look at the Hessian and you can see that it also is like a point. Um, Actually, I'm yeah. Are you minimizing the navigator or minimizing delta sigma region the navigator? We are minimizing delta sigma oh, okay. using the navigator. Just to make that clear. You get the upper bounds, then that can be understood. After you get the upper bounds, the two values. Sorry, I, I, well, what do you mean? I, I'm not showing any upper bounds. And these aren't upper or, or lower bounds. I mean, like, they, 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 these, are, they, they, these are just estimates from the, the navigator. So it's like, so like the idea is that imagine you have some like space of, of uh, scaling dimensions, and imagine it looks like a dagger. We're going to the point of that day. And so I don't know if I'd really call them lower or upper bounds. I mean, I guess you could maybe call them convex holes. Yeah. I guess what Andrea means is that the yeah. kind of nature of the delta sigma that you find in this method is smaller than the... Yeah, it, 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 it is natural, yeah. That's but why are the other numbers also small? That's, that's not... It will be... Yeah, I, 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 don't, I don't have an explanation. I mean, yeah, you would only be able to see that if you actually had like a full mapping of the full space, which we're probably not going to do. So I would say I would see this as a conjectural statement. Uh, but I mean, the main point of evidence is just that we, principle, yeah. I mean, in, in principle, you could. Yeah, but, but I mean, but I expect the error bars would be incredibly tiny because I expect that this is really the point of the change. So I, I don't think there should be much room for them to change. Anyways, I mean, the, the, main, the main lesson I'm trying to show is that this conjectured method gives an answer which is very close to the tricritical pop CFT. And so this should convince you that this conjecture method works. Because um, we match all three of these guys. We also, I should note, obtain the ratios of OB coefficients, which in principle could also be matched against predictions from the minimal model, although we haven't checked them. But that would be yet another check. And so considering there's like 13 parameters, I'm, all of them will, will probably match. Um, okay, so, so, so this is the result in 2D, which should help motivate why this method works. Uh, and now let me discuss how we go above 2D. So our bootstrap changes in two ways as we go above 2D. So first of all, we use global conformal blocks uh, in terms of the global conformal group, SOD plus one comma one. And so these blocks are known to be smooth functions of D, Schull and Dolan and Osborne. And so that's why this is kind of a natural continuation above 2D. The other thing that changes, is that instead of imposing a gap to two, when we were saying these are the certain number of relevant operators, now that we are looking at D, we are just saying these are a certain number of operators lower than D. And so that's the other thing which changes as D changes. But these are the only changes in terms of D. And so this is why I think this is a very natural um, uh, generalization above D. Um, so I should note that some CFTs in fractional D have operators with large scaling dimensions that violate unitarity. So for instance, with IC models are shown by Slavin collaborators. But the contribution of these high dimension operators are highly suppressed in the block expansion. So it's hard to actually see them from the numerical bootstrap, which is why when people did the numerical bootstrap of the IC model, they, they observed that it actually matched the epsilon expansion very accurately. And so basically the bottom line is you shouldn't be worried about this violation of unitarity because it's incredibly small. Five minutes? Okay, thank you. Um, so this violation of unitarity is different from the violation you see for complex CFTs, which is a much bigger violation of unitarity, which is noticeable from the bootstrap. Okay, so let me let me now show the results. Um, so the I'm going to show you results for the four critical exponents one by one. So let's start with delta sigma. So the blue line is tricritical setup. Green line is critical setup, and this the x-axis is space-time dimension d. And so that means we start with d equals two, where the red dots show the minimal model prediction. So as we showed before, you start very close to the minimal model, 
uh, and then the two uh, estimates are getting closer and closer. Um, and it's even a bit hard to distinguish them as D gets bigger because they're so close for a while. Um, it's easier to distinguish them by looking at the other critical exponents. So let's look at delta sigma prime. Um, so in that case, we see that uh, the two theories are getting very close to merging at around D equals 2.5. Now, we haven't went precisely to D equals 2.5. We stopped at around D equals 2.47 because our numerical setup started having a lot of instabilities at D equals around 2.47. And I think that's simply because there are, these two kinks are very close to each other. And so that's why it's harder for the navigator to find each one. Um, and so that's why, unfortunately, we can't see the precise merger, but we can get very close. And I think just by looking at this plot, you can probably guess that it, it will probably merge around 2.5, yeah? If you go above like 2.6, you see nothing. Well, yeah, you, 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 yeah, you, you would also get nonsense results. I mean, the point is that you start getting nonsense results at around 2.4. Um, Indeed, yeah, yeah. So, so we also, for the track, so for the critical theory, we observe uh, a change. And so I'm still running more points. So that's why it's unfinished. Um, I don't know if this is going to be a discrete change. It might just be a rapid change. Um, I don't know why that happens. It's interesting. Um, yeah, so uh, so you could see there was also like a, a kink, you know, in this guy, a smaller one, and this one shows a, a bigger one. So yeah, so it's interesting. Although look, it doesn't happen at precisely two, so I doubt there's any real physical meaning to this. I think it's just, you know, all kinds of weird things can happen. Um, okay, so now let's look at delta epsilon, similar phenomenon that they get closer and closer until around D equals 2.5. Uh, and then finally for delta epsilon prime, um, so in this case, I only show the line for the tricritical theory, because for the critical theory, you know, that's not relevant. And this gray line is just marginality. So this is just when D, this is just when delta epsilon prime equals D. And so again, you see that it's getting very close to being marginal as D approaches 2.5. And so basically the point is that from all these plots, we see the exact same pattern, which is that the two theories are getting closer and delta epsilon prime is going to marginality as D goes to 2.5. And so unfortunately, we can't get precisely to 2.5 due to this numerical instability, uh, but, but we get as close as we possibly can. Okay, so let me comment on a curious coincidence. So it seems like the merge and annihilation of the critical and tricritical pots is happening at around V equals 2.5. And recall that the P critical icing model with Lano Ginsburg potential phi to the 2P minus 1 um, merges and annihilates with the free theory when D critical is 2P minus 2 over P minus 2. Um, and so in particular, the pentacritical icing model in 2D is the minimal model with the same value of C as the tricritical Hox model. They only differ by the modularity. So one's a diagonal minimal model, one's a non-diagonal. And so this pentacritical icing model, that has D crit equals 2.5, because you just plug in, you know, the appropriate value of P there. The dimension of phi? The dimension of phi. Um, so yeah, so the, the, the dimensions of like, you know, what you would call sigma and epsilon don't appear to be close to, to what we observe here. So like the only kind of coincidence is the fact that you get D crit equals 2.5 for this pentavertical I signal. The dimension of sigma is not close to 0.35? Uh, no. I mean, as you see here, it's going, it's around 0.35. Yeah, so, uh, so I don't know if this means anything. It's just interesting that specifically in D equals two, there was a similarity between tricritical pos and pentacritical. And the decrypt for pentacritical happens to be very close to what we're observing. So maybe there's a deeper reason, maybe not. Hopefully someone in the audience maybe can think Sorry. about it. Yeah. There is a Landau Ginsburg description on non diagonal minimum models. But they're not, yeah, yeah, but they're not very good ones. Very well. yeah. yeah, it exists, but it's not a very good description. I mean, so like, uh, no, it's the marginal in 60. You know. um, anyways, so in conclusion, we propose a bootstrap setup for the critical and tricritical plots that naturally applies to any D equals two or bigger. And that's really the important thing is that like, unlike these previous studies, which had kind of these ad hoc, you know, fractal lattices, we have a method, which I think is very natural to relate D equals two, as well as, you know, D bigger than two. Um, the second important point is that in D equals two, we found sharp kinks in our bootstrap plots that precisely match the known 2D minimal models. And so this is a check of our method. They were able to match, you know, the known critical exponents to three digits. And then as we increase D to be bigger than two, we found that both kinks got closer and closer until they seemed to disappear near D equals 2.5. But epsilon prime became marginal, which is evidence for the merger and annihilation scenario. So there are many future directions. So first of all, we'd like to improve these kinks by increasing the bootstrap precision and looking at more correlators. Um, so in particular, we're hoping that by increasing n max, um, we will be able to really see the precise merger and annihilation. So like this instability we're seeing, I strongly suspect it's just because we're looking at very low n max. Uh, and I'm, I'm hoping that this will be solved with higher evidence. 
If yeah. It's possible that if you have a larger impact, then you could just repeat the non impact. Yeah, but like. I can this things for high school. Yeah. And we'll find for smaller maps, we can get a island, very tiny island. And yeah. But if, if the maps is large, it just be yeah, so yeah, it, it, it's possible. It's possible we might we might run into that issue. Yeah, so yeah, that, that, that is something to keep in mind. Um, it would also be nice if we had higher in max, we could maybe read off the spectrum, and then we could see how delta epsilon prime goes to marginality from above for the critical setup. Because right now we're just reading off these scaling dimensions of the relevant guys. We're not looking at the spectrum because we're too nervous to look at the spectrum because we don't have high enough in max. But if we were more confident, then we could read off the spectrum, and then we'd have more information on delta epsilon prime. Also, we could generalize this whole story to general Q. So far, we've just done Q equals three. Uh, but in principle, you could derive the cross equations for general Q, which uh, Ning, Su, and collaborators did for the sigma four point function. Uh, and then you could try to match the various predictions from the lattice, although you might have issues with unitarity. So I think when Q stops being an integer, then it becomes like a logarithmic C of T. Um, also, more generally, it'd be nice to apply this new approach of minimizing some scaling dimension with the navigator in order to find the merger and annihilation of other strongly coupled CFTs. So for instance, there's a big ongoing question of, you know, does QED3 have some lower critical value of the number of flavors where it would maybe merge with QED3 star, which is the same theory except with a different potential. Um, and so various bootstrap studies have suggested maybe this is the case. Um, uh, but one lesson of the study we did here is that sometimes it's very hard to get islands, but nonetheless, you can still get kinks, which accurately match the theory. Um, and it's hard to see these kinks if you have a very large parameter space, but by using the strategy of you know, minimizing the navigator in terms of some scaling dimension, that can efficiently allow you to get these kinks, and that might be the path forward um, to study other merger. Okay, so uh, that, that's it. What's QD3 star exactly? What potential are you referring to? Um, I think it's, you just have like a Fermi onto the four potential. I, I, think, uh, I think it's what people refer to when they're talking about QD3 star. So I guess basically gross nouveau. Yeah. I think, uh, yeah, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that's the scenario. Just the vision. Yeah, that's the invitation people use. But, yeah. uh, is there a motivation for this merging of the two theories, say, for example, for epsilon expansion? Well, the, the S and the, uh, so there, there's no good epsilon expansion for the POTS model. So, so why would you expect such a managing from, from well, maybe you said at the beginning, but I, I could well, okay. I mean the reason well the reason you might hope there is emerging is that the two theories only differ by one relevant singlet operator. And also we know that they are CFTs in two dimensions, and experimentally we know they are not CFTs in three dimensions, and so they had to disappear somewhere in between. And so it's possible that they could have disappeared not by merging with each other, they could have just merged with like the free theory in some trivial way. But it seemed likely that they could merge with each other because they were so similar. And indeed, that's what we then found. So, so you see this operator approaching marginality? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like, I mean, like that, 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 that's what we showed in this plot uh, here. So this is delta epsilon prime, and you see it's the gray line's marginality, and it's getting very close around D equals 2.5. Uh, is there a flow between the two before uh, merging? I mean, presumably, yes. But like, there's no perturbative expansion, which would allow you to study it. I mean, like, this is why we have to use the bootstrap, because these are very strongly coupled theories. So this is our only method of studying this. Well, in 2D, there are minimal models, and so everything's exactly so, so solvable. But you know, I mean, like this is why it's an interesting problem, you know, because it's like you don't have any perturbative method, you don't have any good epsilon expansion. You only have the bootstrap. Okay, equal to two, you you do have that because there is a flow sure. among all the, the minimum models. Yeah, sure. I mean, in, in D equals two, but I'm saying but 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 above D equals two, you know, which is where you expect this merger and annihilation to occur. Yeah, so in D equals, you already know everything. The question is above D equals. So a question. So you studied the state state level. level. Oh, so far, go ahead. Uh, well, I, I should say for all that, okay, great work, and I fully agree with your premises and the flows and the merger and stuff. But I'm a bit worried about one aspect of your plots. And on, on the basis of this plot that you showed, I would rather interpret them as saying that the merger should happen around d equal 2.3 what why and all this uh, other stuff that you see above 2.3 is kind of numerical argument uh why do you you say okay so i agree that in this plot the guys got very close so to d equal to the, the, the last quarter in this one 
But with one aspect of the first generation scenario yeah. that you did not mention, but which is very important, which is that when merger happens, yeah. all dimensions behave with a square root singularity. Sure. And you kind of see the square root behavior around 2.3, and then it just like changes to some linear behavior, which just cannot be correct. I mean, so when D crosses, when, when this further epsilon prime crosses marginality, it should cross with a, a square root. Oh, um, okay. So yeah, and so it should be yeah. seen in all dimensions, not just in this one, but also here there should be a square root. And we don't see this, and here there should be a square root. Um, yeah, yeah. So yeah, so this so is the reason for the square root. I mean, is it well, it comes from this comes from the analysis of the RG equation flow to uh, to the merger and from the existence of this RG flow which connects the two points close to the merger. So it's it's like a well known simple pair. Oh. From the fact that the RG equation looks like the beta function, which is like uh, lambda squared plus a constant or lambda in development couple. And so this is very this is uh, Verified in in two in two D, for example, when you look at the plot model and three D function of Q, which is verified in the exact solution. Well, okay, expect this to be true. Sure, but I just want to comment that we don't actually see the precise merger annihilation yet due to this numerical instability. So it's well possible that if we were to like have this, the correct plot going all the way up into the true value of D crit, maybe it would show square root. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it's like you know, I turn this around and say that before I see the square root, I don't believe that this is not in the right part. Fair enough. Yeah, yeah. So like um indeed, like you know, we eventually want to be able to get precisely to decrypt with current technology that's difficult. Although I understand that you guys are working on an improved navigator, which uh I guess if and when that finishes, then we can go to higher and max, and then we could get even closer to decrypt, and then we can see, you know, hopefully the square root behavior. But yeah, so what we're agnostic with the square root behavior at this point because we're not actually going to precisely decrypt. And so, like, you know, it would well be the case that it would suddenly become, you know, square root, uh, you know, very close to, to decrypt. I mean, I, I just, I'm just not so confident that the merger annihilation is really happening at D equals 2.3, because then that would imply that, like, this is very poorly converged, which again is also possible, you know. I mean, it could be that, like, as you increase in max, like, maybe these things will get way closer to each other such that they will really merge at 2.3. And like the rest no, no, no. will end up just being but an American artifact. It's actually quite plausible because actually your definition of a delta sigma as a minimum possible delta sigma, this definition makes sense for any D. So your plot should show something for any D. I think, anyway, let me put it on record. I yeah. bet that once things can you know, converge, the grid was going to be 2.3. Great. Yeah. I mean, I would be happy if that's the case. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm not committed to 2.5. Yeah. Uh, question? Yeah. Do you, do you have um, results for the OB coefficients for these low line operators? Uh, yeah. We have the results for the ratios. Um, yeah. So, like, yeah, we, we do have those. We haven't compared them to anything. Um, mostly, it's, it's just, I mean, in 2D, I guess we would have predictions. And so, in principle, we could compare. It's kind of a tedious exercise because you have to fix all kinds of normalizations and whatnot. But, yeah, but related to some of us points, yeah, you know, if we believe that the, the merger happens close to 2.5 or 2.3 or whatever, we can try to do a formal perturbation theory to go from one theory to the other, yeah. And I mean, yeah. I mean the first one would be good enough, and then you can check the consistency, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So that, that would be a nice thing you could do. Um, I don't know if the OP ratios we have would be sufficient because sometimes for like that study you need like very specific OP coefficients and not not the ones you access. Have any scaling dimension? We do. Yeah, we do. Also, we only we only have ratios. We don't we don't have like the absolute value. There's just one number that you're missing. Probably. It's so one very simple relation I think between the dimensions of the nearly margin of operator in the UV and <laughs> Uh, but what would be the UV? Well, there are two two big points, right? Suppose sure. you have this slightly to lower the point. Yeah. And you measure the dimension of this here, the marginal operator. And that's another so, way of saying Slava's point that it's yeah, yeah. a square root vision. Yeah. It follows from the RG point, yeah. but their sound is too deep. Right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. So we indeed expect the square root behavior. We just Aren't close enough to decrypt to really know if it's there or not. 
And so indeed, there are two possibilities. One possibility is that as we increase n max, you know, we'll get all the way to t equals 2.5, and suddenly it'll be a square root, and then and then and then the answer will be t equals 2.5. The other possibility is that um, the plots will change more drastically, and that they will actually merge uh, maybe around d equals 2.3, as suggested by this first plot. Um, and then you could say we've already kind of seen the square root behavior. Um, although by the same token, like if the plots are to change so much as we increase n max, who is to say that they wouldn't also change in the lower region? You know, so it's like then then, then all, all bets would be. Um, kind of, you know, just looking at this plot more and more, the more I stare at it, the more I find it weird. And the model is a very simple model. And yeah. Why should the dimension of stigma prime and epsilon prime? In this interval between two and the critical, have this weird shape with the kid. Okay, it so probably just be like some very simple looking curve. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. So, like, I mean, the, the, the kink is something we don't have an explanation for. Yeah, and it's interesting to understand why, why it's there. And so, why we have to get rid of the kink and just to ignore like everything is to the right of the kink in the narrative and the plot should stop there? Possible. Um, uh, I mean, yeah. <laughs> Although, I mean, look, I, I, I wouldn't say, like, I mean, people observe such sharp discontinuities in other bootstrap studies. I mean, this isn't something which is unheard of. Well, I mean, I, I, I mean, and Ning told me that stuff like this is observed in the IC model in fractional D, that, that, that you also see sharp changes. No, but like, okay, so for instance, when you go from D equals two to D equals above two, there's clearly a very sharp difference, right? Because in one case, you have Virasaur symmetry. In fact, you have W3 symmetry, and in one case, you don't. And so it's not surprising that you would observe a sharp change near D equals two. It's a sharp change, but not the uh, normal monotonic. Yeah, but I mean, first of all, I mean, I don't know why you define a smooth or not smooth. I mean, we're, we're looking at addition more points here. It could well be smooth, just very sharp. But I'm saying like, to me, it seems completely expected that there should be a big change between D equals two. Uh, well, I mean, yeah, there is hope. Like, yeah, we certainly would like to do higher in max in the future. I mean, with current technical abilities, that's impossible, but that should hopefully be possible in the future as the navigator improves. Could be that you, the dagger would step your time to time is somehow rotating. And minimizing the dimension of sigma prime is no longer a good thing to do above d.205 or something like that. So you're not actually finding the tip, you're, you're stuck on the side. It's possible, although I think you're being hard to check that. Do you think people that work on practical lattices have any results that you could compare to? Well, I mean, so unfortunately they don't, because they can only look at specific values of D. And for those values of D, they're looking at the general plane of D and Q. And so, so like the results I showed in the beginning of the talk, they would look at some like weird value of D and then they would get some estimate for Q, which is like some real value. So it's like, they're not, they're not fixing Q equals three and then changing D. And so like, you can get things that you can like very roughly compare, but you know, it's hard to, so like, okay. So, you know, maybe some, some like weak evidence in favor of D equals 2.3, uh, you know, as Slav is suggesting, is that one of these estimates gives roughly d equals 2.3. So, like, if we go back to the beginning of the talk, uh, we can see that the estimate, I think it was the last one I did, is um, here. So, like, so this analysis by those guys in the 80s, they, they said that q is roughly, sorry, that d is roughly 2.3 when q is roughly 2.85. And so you could say that, like, you know, this is in the in the the neighborhood of around 2.3. And so if you believe the study they did, then this would suggest that maybe the answer should be 2.3. But like, I would be very hesitant to, you know, give too much credence uh, to these fractal lattices. Well, the last question. Yeah. Can you allow scaling to be complex and draw this? Well, well, you can't do the bootstrap because it it relies that the scaling dimensions are real. I mean, I mean, you can still look at crossing equations when things are complex, but then you don't have uh, the numerical bootstrap method. You just have, uh, I guess, a non-rigorous set of equations. If you believe this 2.3 to a 2.85 point, if you start increasing Q, that will be D, right? So yeah, it would get to the lowest point three. Yeah, yeah. So if if you if you believe that, then it would suggest that you know decrypt would be around uh, maybe a little bit below. The lowest point. Yeah, or, or, or something like that. So, 
Yeah, I mean, it's possible. On the other hand, though, like, look, I mean, I, I think like the non-trivial thing I want to emphasize is that all four of these scaling dimensions are all getting very close at precisely the same value, and delta epsilon prime is becoming marginal. And this is something very non-trivial, you know. So it's like, and so you know, sure, you know, perhaps it's surprising that there's this weird kink, and like, you know, perhaps precisely at the merge you expect square root behavior, but like you should not forget the most non-trivial thing, which is the fact that like the theory is merging and it's becoming marginal at exactly the same time. And I think it's very unlikely that that's just like some random numerical noise. Okay, so I think we'll stop here. So uh, thank you. Bye. <laughs>